We've got the non-public session minutes from October 4th. Um, I imagine we're just going to package those with the other minutes at this point, and when we go to review those together, we Great. can approve those. Yeah, that sounds like okay. Um, next up is to approve the uh, the job description work session from December 13th, 2012. What about the 1B? Well, that's, that is 1B, I think. Oh, 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 okay. Um, in a motion to approve those. So moved. Second. Is that good to me? You see him? No. That was a pretty short one. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up is the select of the meeting minutes from December 20th, 2012. Entertain a motion to approve those. So moved. Just for the record, I'm staying on that one because I wasn't at that meeting. The job description. I guess if you could second maybe these ones. No. Second. As a second for Bob's <laughs> motion there. Any edits or amendments? For attempt December 20th? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yep. Brings us to public comment. Can I ask one quick question? Sure. Could, could you possibly move up the election hearing now into the public comment? Because Beth, who actually is a witness to some of this stuff, has to leave and uh, it would help. Because otherwise, you've been committing the budgets. Um, well, let's 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 get through public comments first, and then I'll we'll, we'll go through that. Can okay. I have to make a brief statement? Sure. I come before the board of selectmen tonight <clears throat> in public session to formally report continued actions of reprisal against me for having brought a grievance complaint this past February against Jerry Dockey the Ford for discrimination, threatening, and bullying me. In accordance with the report of findings regarding my grievance, I am to report acts of retaliation against me to Selectman John Allen. I complained to John on numerous occasions regarding Jerry's unrelenting and repressive control over office affairs in my department, which were just ignored. Finally, on December 19th, I brought complaints again to John Allen. This time, his response to me was, if I didn't like my job, I could just quit. It is apparent and in my best interest to submit this complaint of retaliation in a, in a publicly recorded meeting, so my complaints do not continue to be overlooked. This complaint of retaliation is official and now a public document, which I will turn over to be part of the recorded minutes. The rest of this report lists acts and decisions that are discriminatory and constitute retaliation by this board. Thank you. Any response? I have none. No, I haven't seen it yet. I'm not sure what the retaliation is about, but I just want to take a look at the uh, formal complaint before I have a response. So. Do we want to take this up now or no. just move on with the meeting? No, I'm not. Are there any other public comments at this point? Martha? I just need a clarification on something. And I just bring it up and make a lot of I just made a lot somewhere else. Um, in terms of Hank's filming, he started getting paid in March because the town meeting said that he was a lot. Correct. But he had been working in January doing it. So he doesn't get paid for January, February, and March. Um, uh, how, does it, how does that work? Because now we're up against another year, and technically he's not being paid January, February, March this year. 
I, well, I don't understand how it works. I'm sorry. I, I don't think necessarily that, that any of us do at this point in time. It, it, it certainly would be taking worth looking at to see if you should get paid for January, February, March of last year. Um, and um, we were just discussing that. I mean, whether we should put it as part of the re regular budget or part of a separate Warren article, um, we don't really know yet. Um, okay. So what I suggested was that maybe um, if Hank writes a letter to us for proposal for this year, um, and I was kind of assuming it would become part of the ordinary budget, but maybe there's a better way to do it if, um, if we need to be looking at increasing anything there. So uh, we need to take a further look at it anyway. So, but thanks okay, for thanks, thanks for bringing it up. I believe that uh, when that came up, uh, there was a specific amount appropriated to do that, wasn't there? Didn't we yep. say three thousand dollars even? So have we burned through all that? Is that is that the issue? We have not. We have not. No. Okay. Um, so I mean, I certainly think it'd be worth looking at because typically when you pass a budget. The budget season begins January, but it you know you don't get the money approved until March. It's a little bit odd. It, usually, you would get paid for you know the work up until that point, and so um, certainly we should, something we should look at anyway and consider. And we'll probably throw it on the agenda for the next meeting and get it okay. get it resolved before the budget budget hearing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Beth? Um, I'd like to go back to the comments made by Diane Falsi earlier and request that the report. Uh, the investigation that was um, um, concerning these items be released, I think, as a, a part of um, just public information um, in order to understand fully what um, the retaliatory um, acts are that Diane has explained. I think it would be helpful to know what the initial <coughs> investigation revealed. I guess there's a couple of things there. I'm not sure what, what report you're talking about be released, but. Um, or would information be released? Um, Is that you referred to? I, I mean, you know, again, we've, we've gone over this several times now. That, you know, there, there was a grievance filed against me from Diane Fauci. It was investigated. Um, at this point in time, we considered a personnel matter, and that's all the comments we really have towards it. Huntley? I late this evening this at the planning board meeting as a subject coming up, and I guess I want to ask all three selectmen if it, if it, just a yes or no. It's a two part question. <clears throat> are you, John, and go right through all three of you, are you in favor of taking residential inspections out of, from, in other words, right now it's, it's expecting commercial, uh, multifamily, and residential. Mm -hmm. And before the planning board tonight is pulling out residential, are you for leaving it in or taking it out? I'm for leaving it in. Jerry? I think you're framing it incorrectly, Huntley. And um, what's being proposed is an option to give the voters a choice to do it. Wait a minute. Yes or no? Jerry? Are you willing, are you want, do you want to take it out or leave it in? I don't think that the answer is a yes or no uh, question, Huntley. Leave it in or take it out. I want to make something clear that this is <clears throat> not what public <clears throat> comments are for. And if well, this is, since I have the floor, I'll go ahead and give a complete explanation. Uh, public comments are a time for the public to come and comment to the select board as we're having a meeting on any issue that concerns them. And so, I think there will be plenty of time, and, and again, we can do this at the next meeting, to put that item on the agenda and have an in-depth discussion on it. But when people come in to public comments and expect interaction on an issue that's important to them, they're taking away from the agenda that the town office administrator has put together along with the selectmen for what has always been a full meeting and so we get agenda items backed way way up i mean this is the second agenda is this is second issue proposed during public comments that we could easily spend 30 minutes on it's just a and so meeting. And no. I, well i understand that 
So that's, that's my hesitation for dealing with issues like that during public comments. It takes away from the rest of the meeting. So now, I will, just so I'm clear on this, I will support the way that the planning board wants to put this warrant article out. I will vote against it, but if they want to separate it out like that, I support that. That's, so what you're asking me, and I think maybe this was one reason why Jerry said, was a little hesitant about the way you framed that question. It's like, do I support it in the sense that I'm gonna vote against it? No, I don't support it. But I do support it being uh, on the warrant article, separated out like they're, like they're talking about if that's what the majority of the planning board members want to do. Did the selectmen bring this to the planning board? No. Jerry, you, you did not? No. Did Jerry bring it to the planning board? I to, did. Uh, I did. Not to my knowledge. You didn't like, yes, you did. you didn't like inspections because you said you did, right? Because Again, Ray, honey, kind of, I mean, I guess to, to reinforce what Bob's saying here, you know, we're going through the process. The planning board is taking it on. Um, and that's where this discussion belongs. Um, and um, and that's really all there is to say about it, I think. I mean, um, and this is a great example of why it's difficult to deal with issues during public comments because you said you had a question, you got the answers, and then it's a follow-up question. All, all it was yes and no. Yeah, and I and I gave you exactly how I felt about it, and then there was a follow-up question. Well, did the selectmen bring this to the planning board or what? Well, you know, if it has if it has the majority of their support, you know, that's the way it's going to go. And I and I so I respectfully. Uh, recognize and acknowledge what you've contributed to public comments and I'm happy it doesn't really it's not the end of the world that uh, they're meeting tonight and and everybody's got to take sides before they come into their session I'm, I'm, I, I think this should be on the next if you're willing to come in here and and have a more in-depth and robust discussion on this it should be on the next meetings agenda well, the problem I've discussed with Jerry has gone to no place, you know, in the past, privately and you know, at meetings. Well, we don't talk between meetings, and so that's an issue. So uh, you're, you're telling me things that are news to me. So uh, I'm, I, again, once again, the offer is, especially if you'd like to come at the next meeting, I, I think okay, I'm happy to have it on the agenda, and, and I'm happy to, to have an in-depth conversation with it. And our record is that we have not, once we've gotten into agenda items, ever um, refused comment from the audience when somebody's had pertinent to add to discussion on agenda items. One quick comment, uh, with no, I don't need a response. Last year, we went out and got uh, a warrant placed on the ballot, uh, on, on a warrant, and, and the, the vote was approximately 160 to 40. In favor of continuance of the building permit and inspection process as it had been followed in Jackson. I know there were a couple of intrinsic problems with a $10,000 minimum and a, and a uh, uh, occupancy permit. But the town, in its infinite wisdom, showed up. The room was 70-80% stood up and said, we want it. Gino, I, listen, listen, actually, I'm going to just... I'm just, I'm just looking for an answer, Jerry. I'm just saying, I just want to... Gino, I'm just trying to get our meeting on. The comments that you're making right now have been addressed all year long by the planning board, have been addressed by us all year long by the planning board. And I don't think it has a place for our meeting tonight. Jerry, I mean, you're not the representative of the planning board, but you're the one that's filled the planning board with all these ideas. John Allen's the representative of the planning board. In the eight, six years I was there, four years on the planning board as, as a rep, I never had a select you know, come in and discuss with the planning board what they, another selectman, what they wanted to do. It was always a selectman's rep that brought the information back to the select board. It was, it's being done a, a totally different way. Fine, look, I don't even need to comment. I know where you stand, that's a little different. Thing. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Let's move on to the police report. Ethan Carl. Right, 
<coughs> we had a, a total of six uh, false order alarms. Um, we uh, took a uh, complaint from the highway department uh, of a vehicle parked on the roadway on Red Barn Road. Went over there, uh, tried to make contact uh, with the homeowners. No one was there. Um, so that, that car was ticketed. We were called to a uh, local motel on a call, and uh, the staff there refused our services. So um, that was, uh, they elected to go with the Sheriff's Department. <coughs> it was just the fire company with a, um, a, a trash can that had caught fire in a garage up on um, North Hampton Ridge. Uh, we, if you followed the e news, we um, uh, assisted uh, some citizens with a dog that had escaped. It was a Christmas present. And uh, we called in our um, animal control officer. The um, dog was at least at large for two nights out in the cold. And um, through a networking she con found a dog trap. And um, he drove over to Naples to get it, came back, set it up. In the morning of the oyster came in, five that morning, the, um, the dog got caught in the trap. So, um, and then um, and she had to return that trap all on her own dime. But it was a great thing because the dog was a Christmas present to a, a grammar school kid. Uh, we arrested a gentleman um, who had legal drugs on him uh, during a car stop. Uh, there's a vehicle that uh, uh, went off the road um, during the snowstorm we had. And I'll, on the backside of Dundee, and uh, we had to call a, a record to get him out. Um, we took up a, a plowing complaint about how a, a um, driveway was being plowed, two driveways. Um, a took a call of a box truck that got stuck up in a cul-de-sac and <clears throat> was not able to get out. <clears throat> so we got a hold of the town highway guys to come up and sand assault. Get the truck on its way. Uh, vehicle off the road, up in the notch. Um, we, uh, somebody found a, a debit card and, and turned it into us. Uh, we took possession of a intoxicated subject walking on 16 and um, uh, was able to call the parents. Um, and turned the person over to the parents. Assisted the uh, ambulance with an uh, ice skater that fell. Uh, motor vehicle accident on Route 16, just north of the um, Eagle Mountain Road. Uh, vehicle off the road at Thornhill Road. A fireworks complaint uh, by Black. A um, parking complaint up on a presidential. Um, that it, it inhibited the town from doing the job properly. Those cars were ticketed. Um, assisted the uh, town highway um, at a residence where some cars were parked in the driveway, but they were kind of sticking out. So I went around and asked them to nudge in as, as much as they could. Uh, served a subpoena uh, on a parent whose uh, child had um, um, was acting out. We arrested a, um, a young man for uh, having an open container of alcohol in a car. Uh, took three uh, 911 calls to a local hotel. It turned out to be a child uh, playing with the phone. Uh, it's just the ambulance at a, a hotel with a uh, subject that was having an allergic reaction. Uh, the, car accident, uh, a car backed into another car in a parking lot. And um, we had a complaint, it's, it's a civil case. Um, that's nothing really to do with us yet, but you could later on, uh, the uh, husband and wife are splitting up in child custody and it's it's not going as agreed. So um, it's, it's really gonna be for lawyers to, to do unless Goes a rhyme, so that's about it. That's enough.
<laughs> Beth, I apologize. I forgot that we were going to move that up. And as soon as we get done with the police report, we'll go to the electioneering um, issue. Um, was there anything else about the police budget that anyone had any questions or discussion about at this point? About the police report or the budget? About the, oh, either, I guess. But Right. Um, no, I don't have anything about the report. Or budget. John? Mm -hmm. I imagine you're probably going to want to um, stay around for the yeah. next part of the discussion. So, um, Stay here back there. Frank, we put the uh, electioneering matters in, into this meeting from further discussion that we had at the, the last meeting. We were kind of pinched for time, so we had postponed it until this meeting. So you know, that's what we're here to discuss anyway about the electioneering matters. Um, so. Um, well, why don't I try to summarize what I think my concerns are. Um, this arises from election day, town elections, a, uh, almost a year ago now, uh, when several of us were prevented from electioneering. Um, both on public and private property. And we felt that um, our rights are being infringed on. We complained that day to the Attorney General. The Attorney General's office got back to us and said that indeed uh, we could not be prohibited from uh, electioneering on public property. Uh, when I discussed that with uh, Willis, he uh, that he didn't care, he, uh, and if I persisted, or if uh, Gino and Beth persisted, uh, he'd have us arrested. Um, so, and if we, if we could either be arrested or file a written complaint. Uh, so we filed a written complaint, and some time ago, of course, the Attorney General got back to us and I think the pertinent part of the letter was that the, at the bottom of the second page, the Attorney General states, or the uh, Assistant Deputy Attorney General states that while the town has discretion to set and enforce a zone where no electioneering is permitted, uh, it, uh, so it cannot be uh, so broad as to prohibit electioneers at the location from being able to come in contact with voters should a voter choose to engage with them. At the bottom of that paragraph, uh, they state, upon review of the complaint and discussing the matter with both you, Willis, and the complainant, that was me, we conclude that it would have been difficult for electioneers to have been able to come in contact with the voters at the Whitney Center polling place. I think those two statements lead me to believe and I think lead Gino and Beth to believe that our constitutional rights were infringed on by Kelly um, and the town. And what the reason I think I'm here is in the discussion that you had with Willis two months ago, you went through the letter and then chose to close the matter. Uh, and not take further action. Um, I think that's displaying willful ignorance of what, in my mind, what the mind of two other citizens, and what, as I read the Attorney General's letter, to say um, is an infringement on our rights. Um, <coughs> and I believe it's incumbent upon you to attempt to counsel Willis to find some accommodation. Uh, I don't think it's my place to identify what that should be. Certainly I would be <coughs> pleased if all he chose to do was implement the bare requirements of the uh, of our safe 659.43, which requires a 10 foot free um, corridor from the parking lot where there is uh, no contact with electioneers. 
Uh, I think that would be the right thing to do. Um, I'd close by saying I was particularly concerned with Willis's comments two months ago when he pointed at Bartlett and Conway and made note of the electioneering activity that's present at those polls, looked at Jackson, noted that there was none, and basically said that was a good thing. Or whether he's proud of it. I can't remember exactly which. Um, and I think. Well, I don't think you have much of a right to be placing words in Willis Kelly's. Well, we, it's no. on tape. We can. It's, we can, but it's, 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 it's just, but Frank, you, well, you can express your opinion, okay, but you okay, can't I, be if, saying. If I, if I could finish, <coughs> and then I'll sit down. I mean, all I'm asking at this point um, is to look at the letter again, understand our points. You might discuss it with counsel and try to decide what the next action should be. I don't think you can read this letter and decide not to take any action. Um, again, I think that is you know, really willful ignorance <clears throat> of a violation of our rights. Well, I can explain why I did more than read the letter. I studied the letter, and I can tell you why I felt that there was no further action necessary after studying the letter. Uh, that, first of all, the, the, uh, I, I would certainly reject the premise that you were prevented from electioneering. No one's ever been prevented from electioneering in the town of Jackson that I'm aware of. Uh, we have a 200-foot uh, uh, policy that people are not allowed to come closer than that to electioneer. We had somebody who was electioneering at the last election who came in and got clarification on that and then went out and 200 feet takes somebody across the street and we recognized that. Um, in the letter it talked about recognizing that that made it difficult, more difficult for people to do electioneering when they were 200 feet away. It didn't talk about them being prevented from electioneering, and they did recognize that, and they were concerned that it was too difficult. I think we have a difficult circumstance when we choose to run elections at that recreation center, and maybe it, we need to take a look at where we're doing elections if this is that much of an issue with people. Uh, we haven't had that conversation, but certainly that would be a way to solve the issue if we had a building that was handicap accessible that lent itself easier to doing electioneering within 200 feet of the building. Uh, but right now, uh, I don't know that we have that. And uh, the town moderator's concerns that were expressed to me, as I understood them, were from the public safety standpoint. So, would you rather make it easier for people to electioneer at the expense of public safety or would you rather have safe access to the polling place at the expense of having to have people who choose to electioneer 200 feet from the building? And that's kind of where we're at when we have used the rec center as the polling place. So, um, and, and, and the letter, as when I studied it, d didn't say that that was prohibited. It talked about cases that had had uh, decisions upheld where people were beyond 100 feet. It referred to a case where people were not permitted within 200 feet. All it could do is cite past uh, precedents and, and did not weigh in. It suggested we have conversations and when we had the conversation and heard the public safety concerns, and I can visualize this. And that March election had X number of candidates, X number of warrant articles. And for me to try and imagine a March election with people both for and against each candidate and both for and against each warrant article that was on the ballot, all, with, all in the parking lot, while people were trying to safely access the polling place, I could certainly understand where there is a public safety issue there. 
So that's the other side of it, is, is do we want to make it easier for people to electioneer by, by allowing them closer, or do we want to uh, create public safety and access issues? And so it's, it's not that easy, and it's not the perfect site for polling. There's no question about it, but at this point, I think we all know that uh, this is not a handicap accessible place for polling. Maybe we could revisit that. Maybe we could close the library and have it there and have people within 100 feet, even though that's still across the street. Um, maybe we need to take a look at a lot of different issues. Maybe there are other buildings in town somewhere uh, besides the library and the town office and the rec center where we can have that election. But I'm not in favor of setting up a situation where people's safety is going to be at risk because in March we could have had a snowstorm that day. I would suggest that you might wish to speak to council about whether or not this is a constitutional right and you know take action from that. I don't think I don't think you can choose between allowing a constitutional right to exist or infringing on one, I should say versus public safety. You're going to have to come up with some solution. Um, and again, as I read this letter, uh, somebody should be able to walk into the Whitney Center or other polling place and be able to, without difficulty, and that means probably crossing the street in the snowstorm, engage with somebody who is electioneering. Um, and I think that is a that's a constitutional right. As I read that paragraph in uh, the letter, Frank. addressed to Kelly, um, uh, and you know, you, you and I are not going to. I think I'm not sure it's even proper for us to, um, you know, decide what is constitutional. Well, Frank, right what was stated in the letter from the Attorney General? I would like to clarify something you said earlier too. You said on that March election day, you spoke with the Attorney General. Yes. You spoke with the Attorney General that yeah, day. Yeah, I'm sorry, the Assistant Attorney General. Okay. Um, and um, my willful ignorance aside, I would have to say that I just respectfully disagree with you. Um, we did that, that letter, and what that letter instructed us to do was to meet with the moderator and come up with a plan. The plan that we came up with was what we felt was a compromise, and that is, you know, the town ordinance that we passed was to not allow electioneering on any town property. Um, we felt that the safest thing to do with the situation that we have there was to allow for electioneering to occur on the town property across the street. Um, and I understand that you do not like that decision, but that is a decision that we have made. Um, and that's not about constitutional rights, it's about the decision that we made. And that's what that letter instructed us to do. Um, and, um, you know, it's not that I wouldn't entertain the idea of, of having the polling done in, in another building in town, um, if electioneering was something that was important to people in this town, but I'm simply not hearing it. I'm not hearing lots of people coming up to me and saying, we really need to allow electioneering because that's important to me. That's not something that I've heard from people. Um, and if it is someday, if it does seem to be a big drive for that, yeah, I'd entertain the idea of ha having the polling done in another place. Um, but you know, the decision that we made was that decision. Um, you know, there is private property there um, that we have no control over, and we're well aware of that. Um, and aside from that, we can control what we can control. And I don't think that we need to waste much more town dollars on speaking to our attorney about it. I have a question on that because we were witnesses to the events. My wife was threatened with arrest outside their building on private property. Go ahead, you can go ahead. Um, I, I won't call it a threat, okay? I was just warned that if I held signs standing on private property, I would be arrested. I asked Officer Jetty if um, Moderator Kelly asked tells you to arrest me because I'm standing with a sign, will you? He says, yes, I will. But I said, but I'm on private property. I have um, permission to be here. Um, I said, I'll do whatever moderator Kelly says. So I, I think that <clears throat> Mr. Kelly um, needs to be um, 
being introduced to these laws that you are allowed to, I'm sure he knows this. And um, maybe he was calling my bluff that I would allow myself to be arrested. I didn't think it was worth the hassle. And with all due respect, Mr. Thompson, to me, it's a bit of a red herring when you call this a public safety issue. As you probably know, I've been electioneering here for a number of years. And um, to get people to come out and do that is more of a struggle than anything else. So I don't think two or three little people standing with signs creates a safety issue. I've asked moderator Kelly if he would let us stand over there, which is far enough. It's plenty of access to people. We're not blocking anything. It would certainly um, respect the 10-foot corridor. But it would be a lot safer for us to be standing the area between the school and the building, to me, would be a lot safer than across the street where people would have to be going through a parking lot and crossing the street. I think it was a reasonable suggestion. That's all. The only comment I had to make was, uh, and I looked on page three, you have Dean Frank Benish's allegation that you prevented him from electioneering on private property. When they refused, he refused Frank to, his electioneering, by the way, only consisted of a little table with a couple of hand-printed handouts, and he was like 10 feet away from the walkway. That, that's the first part. There were no traffic accidents or anybody tripping and falling over. Okay? So I went in and I, and I talked to, uh, to uh, Bill, and I said, Bill, what's the big deal? Now, I left there, went to a phone, called the owner of the property, he said, it's my land, you can do what you want on it. I went back to tell Bill. Bill called the Attorney General's office. They told him he could not interfere with people on private property, so he directly lied to this board. He did do, he did tell us not to election on private property, or did be likely to be arrests. My mistake was I should have let my wife be arrested. She wanted to, I would have sued the town. So as it sits, I miss the boat, okay? But you keep doing what you're doing, guys. You're doing a really good job. I'm so impressed. <coughs> and just to clarify the, the process here, anyway, um, the decision on how to run the property on election day is the decision of the moderator. That's a strong tradition in this state always has been, and that's typically what the courts have always upheld. Um, the letter instructed the moderator to come to the Board of Selectmen and discuss the matter, um, which and occurred. And the excuse me, but also the town council. I understood, Frank. And, um, Sorry. But unfortunately, the letter we did not have the time the, the moderator came to speak to the Board of Selectmen about it. And at that meeting, we had discussed um, the idea that we wouldn't waste more town month dollars on the um, attorney to vet this out more. We're comfortable with the decision that the moderator's made. Um, it's his decision to make. We've backed him up on that. Um, and that's what, where this matter lies now. And you, know, you have options available to you behind, beyond that, but that's the one that we've decided. It's my understanding, too, just to pass this along to you, Beth, that the, the school has weighed in on that and does not want electioneering done on school property. You know, there's also constitutional requirements that you, if you're going to have a polling place, you have to allow electioneering. Okay. And uh, we always so, have. Uh, they may, so the school board may not be able to <coughs> say that. Or, they may, or in agreeing to have electioneering there, that's part of the requirement that they have to suffer. Frank? Well, electionary has always been done. It's, it's never been it's never been refused. No one's ever been refused a, a right to electioneer. Based on the distance from the polling place, there is an opinion that was weighed in that recognized it was more difficult to electioneer that far out than had they been closer. No, it says it would it would it would be difficult to have come into contact. Right, and that. Being able to come into contact is a requirement, is the constitutional requirement. You cannot be so broad as to, uh, you cannot make it so broad as to prohibit electioneers at the location from being able to come into contact with the voters should a voter choose to engage with them. And it's, and well, the voter can go to the, the electioneer. It's more difficult. Unless they elect your voter. 
Yes, and the, the point of the letter, I, as I read it, you know, is the voter should be able to do that with ease. Um, and crossing over the gazebo is not, in my opinion, nor do, as I read the letter, uh, the Deputy Attorney General's opinion, um, doing it with ease. Did, did the Deputy General ever visit our facility? They had the complaint included photos of this location mm -hmm. and a map. And uh, he spent some time with me on the phone. I certainly described what I thought the physical location was, and uh, they were on the phone with Willis. Did they actually visit this place? I don't think so. I mean, I agree totally with Bob being a, a hazardous situation. I think that the fact that the front door opens up into a roundabout, you know, it's basically a parking lot, and I think if people are out there, you know, um, doing the electioneering, they could be potentially hurt. And I think that's, I think it's not that obtrusive to be across the street. Again, we can go to get the, to the, the electioneer if we need to, but I don't think it's a person, uh, I think the hazard is more of an issue than it is. Uh, again, my, I, I that was our that, opinion. I regard that as an infringement on my rights. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, did, did you unlock, underline that? Oh, that was for the police report. Did you want to talk about that? Um, under the police report? Yeah, because I forgot that too. I, I no, meant to. No, to, we. Okay. We discussed it. It didn't seem like it was going to need to be a town. Okay. That wasn't for you. That was for you. Yeah. Um, moving on to the road agent, fire chief, and transfer station. Um, these are on the agenda. These are on the agenda um, for further discussion if, if there were any. Uh, if there are any more questions or um, ideas that we want to talk about before the. Um, before the budget hearing, there was a couple of things I wanted to talk about in here anyway. Um, under particularly under the maintenance of town property, um, Phil Davies had sent out an email this week asking um, if we had um, considered putting any money in the budget for that, and I don't do not believe that we have. And the money that we've, we're been talking about for maintenance of town property that has not been added yet. Um, and Larry, if you have anything to comment on this, you can speak up too. But what we're seeing here is that this really involves the discussion of knotweed and the prevention of it, um, and really whether we should be putting any money in the budget to deal with it. Um, and myself, I'm not really sure whether we should or not. Um, I know the citizens that are concerned about it. Um, there are things we can do about it for short money, and short money I mean somewhere in the range of probably three to six thousand dollars to to deal with it per year. Um, and the re resistance I've kind of run up against is it doesn't really seem like something anybody really wants to tackle. Jay doesn't really want more to do um, right. on the road crew right now. Um, and Conservation con Commission kind of doesn't really want to deal with it either. Um, so I guess if, I mean, that's kind of long. The short of it now, where do we go from, the, from here with it? Um, is it something you want? I'm sorry. I just quickly, the Conservation Commission is like we don't want to deal with it. Um, it's a huge problem. Um, it's, 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 it's very costly, and we have to deal with it here on Gray's Improper simply because we have to complete uh, a DES permit that we had outstanding. Uh, so we will we will probably use our money to deal with it here, and I was going to see how the town was going to react to dealing with it other, you know, elsewhere to see if they could help us. But um, <clears throat> it's very costly, and you know, probably the best thing to do is, you know, as many private landowners as possible, you know, where it's on their right of way or along their, you know, their their frontage, you know, for them to, you know, keep working at it. But it's 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 not a it's not a thing that you'll you know, not we, you're not going to get it under control and, and end it. I don't, I don't think any township in America has. You know, it's, it, it just keeps coming back. And, um, I mean, this is going to be a, it'll be a long-term 
problem. Eventually, the country's going to have to deal with it. If you've driven down any highway in America, you see it everywhere. Every state, every. So I don't. But I think it's going to be a local battle probably for a long yeah, time to come. It's going to be interesting to contact the state and other towns, maybe the North Country Council, to see what other towns have done for it. But it's, it's not. Yeah, from, and from speaking with people, it seems like most towns either have someone that that does it for them in the town, um, or they hire a licensed herbal person to go out and and spray and um, contend with the weeds. I mean, it's you know, short of putting more money in the budget, there isn't going to be really anything we can do as a town at this point in time. And that's what I guess really our big question is: Should the board of selectmen offer money in the budget to? To deal with, and I think that we'd have to be putting somewhere in the range of five to six thousand dollars for this year in order to have a way to contend with it. Now, there may be ways to spend less than that if Jay slipped out the door already, he probably knew I was talking about not leaving. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so, um, it really becomes a matter of if we appropriate money, who's going to kind of take it on and do something about it? Um, and um, I guess I'm just is it a warrant a, article type of uh, proposition here? We, we could put it separately on a warrant article. And that was, as I remember the conversation that we had when Phil came in, was we talked about putting it on a separate warrant article. And his latest um, correspondence with the town referred to that. I didn't read the full email, so yeah. that's helpful to know. So did that come directly from him, or did that come through, uh, through you, Diane? Diane, that, that uh, correspondence from Phil about the knotweed, that was, uh, was that something that you forwarded on to us that yes. came to you? Yes, it did. Yeah. So I'm not sure I can't really find it. I thought it was looking for it. Can I send it to you from the office? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank you. And, uh, and, and so I think that it, having it separated out on its own, own warrant article would would probably allow us to have an honest get a sense of how the townspeople feel about it, but I don't want to take up too much time here because I, I recognize Jay's back in the room. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything that you want to weigh in with on on what not we talking about? Not we. Not we. Uh, that's the conservation commission's problem. <laughs> I'm done with that. <laughs> Do you know what other towns in the valley do uh, uh, about knotweed, if anything, Jay? I haven't heard of any doing much. Bartlett, but I Conway. Don't know, I don't know much. Well, Bartlett got a grant, uh, but it was on. Uh, I think there's some. I think for the school because it was on school property, or, and they actually got a grant to help them with that. But knotweeds everywhere. Right. So where do you stop? Yeah, and where do you start? And, the only thing I was told is you're now you're pretty much never gonna completely kill it. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, and I understand that it would it would need a, at least one uh, further spraying the next year. Yeah. And I know Phil had mentioned that when we had conversations about it, what came up it with me and my ignorance on not we said, well, why don't we just you know mow over it a couple of times and then so well that's even worse that's even worse than doing nothing because then it, it'll tend to spread more if you try and cut it back so it has to be a chemical uh, it who you solution to, I think, somebody oh. said to me the same thing but then <clears throat> phil had dug some research and said it's actually not a bad to cut it it's worse to dig it up oh so it kind of keep uh, why don't we put a warrant article this year on the Warrant and ask people what they want to do. We'll ask for five thousand dollars and have the discussion at town meeting and see if it's something people want to invest in doing or not. What do you think, John? Yeah, sounds good to me. All right, let's do that. Then we'll then we'll get a sense on how people feel. Maybe between now and then we can find a little more about it. And just to increase awareness with everybody about the warrant article and what it means. Jay, you were four and five on the agenda tonight, basically just to, in case there was anything more we wanted to talk about in the budget. Um, we, I think we covered pretty much most things pretty well last meeting, but didn't know if you or any of the board members had any more questions at this point that we wanted to, to vet out about the highway budget or fire budget. 
Yes, I don't have nothing. I mean, you guys have your info. And okay. I, I thought Diane said that you were talking about it tonight and thought that it was going to be going over. So, doing it, I don't have any questions for that. Okay. <laughs> All right. I have a question for Jay. Sure. Can I ask him? Go ahead. See you cloud for the skating rink opposite the school. For the who? Didn't you cloud for the skating rink across from the school? Yeah. Please put signs up. Because that woman that walked across without a sign last year is still having acupuncture. So she can go to bed. Okay. Done. Great. If there's nothing else on the budgets tonight, we can move on to... Thanks, Jay. Jay, it was just in case we had any further discussion about it. Are we going to have a work session, or are you just waiting for the public meeting to... Um, oh, I mean, I, we haven't really discussed it. <laughs> right. As far as in depth. No, probably for our next meeting. I don't know when our, we scheduled we scheduled the budget hearing for February 14th, I think. Um, or seventh, so February seventh. <laughs> what what I think we need to do, Jay, is at the next um, board meeting on the seventeenth, um, we'll want to uh, probably have Warren come in um, and discuss the use of the unreserved fund balance and the implications of that, um, and then have the broader discussion about the you know the greater purchase and and road uh, maintenance at that point. Because um, I think that you know, we've talked about that, but I think the next part of that is to talk with Warren to see what that means if we use that much of the unreserved fund balance to, to do that, um, um, what that looks like, the cash flow, and, and managing the town's money. So, um, we just try to plan ahead a little bit so I don't get told the, the day of that we're discussing it. Yeah, and I, and, and I honestly don't know how much of that discussion you'll really be a part of. No, but, true. But, um, but I think at the budget hearing is probably when we'll have the, the you know the, the large discussion about you know the greater and, and road maintenance. Um, you know, we've talked about it. I think we're we're good with, with what we've talked yeah, about at this point. So kind of up to what people want to do. Sounds good. Thanks for coming. Um, timber matters. Um, transfer station. Transfer station. Um, got nothing. Okay. At this point, I still need to talk to Bartlett about that. I have not yet. All right. Um, um, Timber matters. They entertain a motion for the intent to cut um, Stephen and Denise Dinsmore, R30, lot two. Uh, intent to cut number 12, 23112. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, Next up is the uh, title search service agreement um, between the town and Jane Sanders searches. Um, entertain a motion to approve the contract for 2013. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this? What same, exactly? Same group. Um, this is a service that conducts title searches. Um, and is, that's facilitated through most of the clerk's office, if I understand it correctly. Um, this is the woman that was used last year, um, and Jeanette was happy with and was recommending that we approve um, the contract for the same person for 2013. Um, last year when we had, had done this, we had looked at several different <laughs> options for it anyway. Um, and then this was the one that was selected based on Jeanette's recommendation, so this is okay. 
basically just continuing with the same. So she had a good experience with her, and it's a 12 month contract. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next up, we have the workers' compensation law notice of compliance. Um, I'm not sure this is something that necessarily needs to, a motion and approval as much as a signature more than anything, but um, I guess just to go through the motions, entertain a motion to approve the uh, workers, workers' compensation law notice of compliance. So moved. Second it. All those in favor? <coughs> is this something that comes up yearly? something that comes up yearly, yeah. And this is just um, standard form to be signed by the employer for the employees. It just means you're uh, notifying that you're in compliance. Okay. One signature on that or three? Uh, I believe it is just one. Diane, on this notice, should it be Town of Jackson or should it be my signature or both? Just, or? just one signature is required. Okay. Did we vote? All those in favor? Post, we did vote. The, the purpose of it is to post in the conspicuous place. Yeah. Did we vote on that yes. one? Yes. Before discussion. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's us. Two thousand twelve auditor option schedule. Um, And what's this here for? Do you know? Yeah, that's for um, select we need to decide whether or not they're going to have an elective auditor from last year or they're going to hire an accountant to do an actual audit. Something's required one or the other. So, this was a decision made by the board a year ago, also? Yes. Every year that form needs to be completed. It's required by So we need to choose the option, I guess, this evening. Um, if we go locally elected auditor option, independent public accountant option, or alternative option, um, if you have a waiver under RSA 4131C, paragraph two. Um, The uh, last year, did we look into the whether or not we qualify for an audit waiver? An audit waiver would be um, for smaller towns for populations under 700. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> oh, we need to choose an option then for 
for that. Um, locally elected auditor or independent public account. Um, last year we had um, nobody put their name in for um, the position on the ballot. Um, so we can try again this year. I think it's right. it's a lot less expensive in that we don't pay the person at all versus right. Right. probably would be a ten to fifteen thousand dollar expenditure <clears throat> in the public public account. Right. And and given that my my sense is that we we should have an, a, an elected auditor. Just because we are a small enough town, we're almost at the point where we're small enough to apply for a waiver, but we're not there. Um, we had a report that we uh, from the elected auditor that we did accept. Um, my sense is that we go ahead and do that. Entertain a motion then to um, have a locally elected auditor option for 2013. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Is it something we have to decide on today? Um, a time frame on that? Well, or? I think that we probably yes because. Okay. Um, I don't know when, when is the election sign-ups? Um, yeah, right. it could be before the 17th, That's so we should, right. we should probably. We need to know if it's on the ballot. Yep. Yep. I think you're right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Keep putting 113. It's a letter of thanks to the Jackson Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'll read the letter anyway. Uh, dear Chamber members, on behalf of the Jackson Board of Selectmen and town staff, please accept this heartfelt thank you for your hospitality and for our most delicious, memorable dinner from soup to nuts. Again, we can't thank you enough for your thoughtfulness. People like you make the Valley such a wonderful place to live and work. Yeah. Entertain a motion to approve the letter. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks for drafting that up. That's a nice letter. Yeah. Thank you. It was a good night. Yeah, it was. <coughs> Brings us back to public comment. Gino. Just a quickie. Um, during the conversation with Frank Manish, when he basically described um, his constitutional rights being um, ignored by the town moderator and by this board after the fact, at least that's an opinion. <coughs> and then the comment from a couple of selectmen saying we thought they. We don't want to spend any money on another attorney. It wasn't worth it. We spent many thousands of dollars on the Maui Lewis case that appears to have gone somewhere. By the way. We spent many thousands of dollars on trying to work out a transfer station agreement that was decided by the three selectmen basically sitting here now without much public ado or any vote. We spent Oh, I think somewhere around twelve thousand dollars, or give or take, on the investigation of Mr. Doherty in the situation with uh, Diane Falsy, and then to sit there when a man who has lived in the town for twenty or thirty years, tried to be a public spirit servant, has been on the ZPA, uh, has got degrees from MIT, sits on the planning board, and then to sit here and say. You know, I mean, it might be, a, didn't even say it was a constitutional It is a constitutional issue. He did raise a constitutional issue. And you people sat here and agreed with a man who you were told by three people who were there as witnesses 
that the town moderator had lied. And then to just dismiss it and dismiss him, I think, I think it's harmful to democracy. And I think, really, you folks should be careful with the way you're handling meeting out this stuff. Because I don't think you're really thinking it through. It's just a personal opinion. And uh, I think what he had to say was very, very important. Many, many towns have a 10-foot wide, 200-foot or 100-foot corridor. We've got a football field wide, wide power that is 200 feet long. That is a heck of a lot different. That's all I have to say on it. Just for the record. Football field's 300 feet. Right. Yeah. It's pretty wide. <laughs> Are there any other public comments? Uh, does anybody have any board issues? Negatory. New business? I have a new business. Brings us to old business. Um, does anyone have, have anything for board policy this evening? Uh, no, basically it's down under the job description. It's really well off of that. Let's <coughs> move on to vacation policy. Um, this is something we discussed a few meetings back um, and is back on the agenda to discuss further. Um, So I, I think we looked at our personnel <coughs> policy uh, that pertained to our vacation pay when we addressed this issue, and I, I, it's going back several months now, I think it was the first time we, we looked at this, and the issue was around um, town employees that are working four day weeks. and. In other words, 10-hour days. So when they put in for a vacation day, do they get paid for eight hours or do they get paid for the amount of time they normally work on one of their days? And we got to a spot where I thought we had it pretty much solidified in our minds that that was, that was a reasonable request. If somebody's working 25% of their hours, on, on a day that they should be, that it was reasonable for them to get 25% of their pay when they take a day off. Um, but we've had it brought back for us again. We've been asked to revisit it. Um, so that's why it's back on the agenda. And I know, Diane, you had had conversations with John about it and wanting to see it back on the agenda. Um, I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Well, you asked me to put something in writing, and I did. Did anybody take the time to read it? Yeah. Because there's a lot of questions in here that um, I raised that um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to be able to compute some of these scenarios that I've listed. Um, <clears throat> for example, um, I'm just going to pick a few here. How many vacation days will an employee who reaches 8 to 12 years of employment get if the policy stipulates a, an additional three days? How will the town pay out those days equitably to either an 8 or a 10 hour day employee? Will the 8 hour day employee receive three days of vacation totaling 24 hours, while the 10 hour day employee will also receive three days and get 30 hours of vacation time? Um, Let's see, also there's, um,
tracking vacation by the hour allows an employee the flexibility to take a few hours of vacation if a full day is not needed, which is popular with many of the office and highway departments. This also improves productivity, benefiting the town if an employee needs to work half a day to meet a town obligation or attend a meeting. Does that now mean employees will be forced to take eight or ten vacation hours and personal time at once when they don't really need that much time for that day? Also, paying the benefits disproportionately will likely encourage employees to only want to work 10-hour days, since an 8-hour day would not be desirable, which would not benefit the town either. Um, <clears throat> the same apology of paying personal time and holiday pay by the day will also create distribution of benefits inequitably. On page 16 of the personnel policy <coughs> is silent regarding how to pay two personal days to either an 8 or a 10 our day employee. The policy just states the Jacks, that the town of Jackson will provide two personal days to all full-time and part-time employees. Concerning holiday pay, <coughs> the policy states on page 14, holiday pay will be paid at the straight time hourly rate and will be prorated for employees <coughs> with regular work, regular work fewer than eight hours on that day. Here the policy states using an eight-hour day as the base number of hours to compute holiday time for part-time people, implying the holiday benefit is eight hours for employees. If a policy or practice needs to change, especially with benefit goals, it would be prudent to implement changes at the beginning of a calendar year and not mid-year, such as this one. This would allow department heads the opportunity to discuss with their employees and set up their work schedules to accommodate to policy changes in order to maximize the best use of their benefits. Um, how, how will I compute um, you know, uh, vacation, personal days, and um, holidays if the highway department works a 10-hour day in the summer and then an 8-hour day in the wintertime? Um, sick time. It doesn't say if you, you know, how to pay it. Um, now, if I come in, and I get sick midday. I go home because I'm puking. Does that mean I have to take eight hours for the whole day? Seems to me I should, it would be to me, uh, make sense to just take four hours. Um, same thing with personal time. If I want to, if I have a dental appointment, does that mean I, I only need a couple of hours? Does that mean I have to use up my whole eight hour personal day? I, I don't think that um, it's a very flexible uh, <coughs> policy if, if you can't have some of these choices. And I think that's how it would really um, affect productivity. So you don't think our current vacation, our time off policy uh, covers an employee <coughs> who uh, works an eight hour day and has to go home sick after, after four hours? It, if that's not clear to you in the policy? How to deal with that? It's no, it doesn't really say that you have to take a whole day. It doesn't say whether whether you can take it by the hour. Okay, but what the policy that you stated when you made this decision to, to pay a full day of, of pay a full day of vacation, does that translate also a full day of, of uh, sick time? Does that mean you have to use your whole eight hour? Or is it going to be 10 hours? Yeah. In other words, are 10 hour um, employees going to get 20 hours of personal time when an, uh, and a person who works eight hours is only going to get 16 hours of personal time? There's an equity here, and I don't think that's fair. If, if, uh, if well, I didn't think we were talking about sick time up till now. I mean, it it's, would seem basic and clear to me that if I have somebody, if the town has somebody in here working a 10 hour day and they go home after, they go home sick after working four hours, that, that they, would, they would be using up six hours of their sick time. And if I have an employee working eight hours during the day and they have to go home after four hours because they're <coughs> sick, that they would be using four hours of their sick time. I don't know, do, do, do you think that the policy is so vague that we we need to revisit the policy and make those statements much more clearer. I do, because if you're if you're going to read the policy in, by the by literally by the word it says, which is what Jerry was saying with vacation time, then 
then it would have to be the same way with uh, sick and, and personal time if it if it doesn't say whether you can whether you can use it by the hour or or you have to use the whole thing. It doesn't really. Well, the vacation pay talked about someone working four hours a week. Right. Or the policy. <coughs> the policy. And, and if it yeah. does, however. Right. So that's clear, right? What it doesn't do is when you when an employee reaches eight years of employment, okay, when, when an employee reaches eight to 12 years of employment, they're entitled to three additional days. It doesn't say how much a 10-hour person's going to get, nor does it say how much an eight-hour person's going to get. So does that mean a 10-hour person is going to get 30 days of vacation benefit while a, an eight-hour person's only going to get 24? I understand the, 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 you know, the difficulty with the 10-hour day versus the 8-hour day. That is something that's not clear in personnel policy in regards to vacation time. Um, again, going back to what Bob said, I think that you know, what we're talking about is vacation time. Um, I don't think that there, the way I read the, the policy, there's much confusion when it comes to sick time, particularly when it says a sick day is 8 hours. Um, now, how that works for someone who works 10 hours is an issue, but that's where someone who works 10 hours may feel like they're, you know, not getting you know, the fair end of the stick. And, 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 but the sick days are a separate issue, um, and what we're trying to do is clarify what our vacation policy is. And we had done that, and um, if, if it's a bad policy, if it's not one that we like, then we should discuss changing it. And this is a good time of year to do that. Um, and. But I would say that, that it's, you know, it's difficult with the kind of employees we have in the town to make everything equitable across the board. We've got a road crew that, you know, it doesn't snow 8.30 to 5 every day. Um, you know, the police department doesn't have emergencies happen only between 8.30 and 5. The way police departments and road crews and fire departments work their hours are going to be basically 24-7. And how you cover that can be difficult. It's going to be different than the way um, the office staff hours will go. So I mean, it's, I don't think it's gonna be possible to create a perfect personnel policy that covers every, situ every single situation. I think there's certainly improvements that can be made for better clarity in our current policy. And I think it's something that maybe um, we should sit, sit down and do. As far as doing it at the beginning of the year, I'm not sure that's gonna be possible with how many other things we need to accomplish for business at this, at this time of the year. As far as the vacation policy itself goes, again, um, it's, um, you know, a day is a day. Um, and that's what the policy states. And, you know, if you work four days a week and you take one vacation day that week, um, should your paycheck be less if you work 10 hour days? Or should, you, should, should your paycheck at the end of the week still be the same? Um, if you get 15 days worth of vacation, and that only translates into 120 hours, but you work 10 hour days, does that mean you only get 12 vacation days that year as opposed to the 15 that the policy says you're entitled to? So the way I read the policy, it, it, it's by the days, that's the way we've interpreted it. Maybe we should change that and we can talk about doing that, um, but... Um, I don't know what the problem is because people who've been working 10 hour days have gotten there 40 hours. Even you know, with the way it was being done. The time that it doesn't work is when you have somebody who's been working for the town for eight hours for eight years and they only get they get three days. I, I don't understand that issue at all, to be honest with you. What I do know is that we had a police officer this year who was entitled to fifteen days of vacation, took twelve and was told that he had no had no longer had any that's, that's not the case. Well, it, it was. was because they reached eight years and they were entitled to three days. And three days was interpreted to be 24 hours, not giving them three full days. It gave them just 24. That's where the problem occurred. Well, well why would you handle those extra three days differently than the first 12? The way the policy is, when, when, you're, when you're vacation time, is divisible by 10. It works for the 10 hour employee. But when you get to the point where you've worked for the town eight years, you get three additional days. And so that's where the problem starts, starting for the police department. Okay? 
when they reach that tier, you know, it, the policy is not clear on how much, how many of those three days a 10-hour uh, person will get. Like it had given an example for five days. So you so, think those three days should be handled differently than the yes, first 12? I think it needs to be either 30 hours or um, it's also, it's, I mean, <coughs> if, you, if you were to give, you know, three days, it's not going to work, you know, for a person who works eight or ten hours. It's, it's, it's not equitable. And so your biggest concern is that after eight years of employment, the three days that you get more each year, you don't think that it's uh, set up equally? Correct. Okay. Yeah, exactly. How about the first 12 days that each employee gets? Are you, are you okay with that? The, the first two weeks are fine. That works fine for an eight hour or 10 hour employee. That works fine. Uh, it's when it gets to, you know, then when they get, <clears throat> then they earn another week that turns into 15 days. That's divisible by 10. That works. It's when you reach 18 days. When you reach that eight year, you get three additional days so that that employee would end up getting 18 days altogether. That's where, that's where the... After eight years, the additional three days is what's throwing you. That's it's problematic. And that's what's happening to the people. Well, my sense is we're going to need at least one more work session uh, here before we get... Yeah, the one thing that, that I had thought of um, in some discussions I had with employees was um, just as a thing to discuss, I mean, to go back to the... To me, that like to use vacation time as, as flex time is not the proper way to handle vacation days. I mean, I wouldn't want to see someone taking half a day vacation. That kind of defeats the purpose of a vacation day in my mind, as far as a, pos a personnel policy would go. Um, but I did think of the idea of taking the personal days um, rather than giving each employee two personal days. Um, what about the idea of giving all um, employees a tw 20 hours of personal time a year? Um, so that you could take an afternoon off if you had a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment um, or wanted to do this. And if, if they all had 20 hours, then that would be a w way to fairly spread it out across all employees. Um, just as a thought, and then you'd, you know, to, get, to take your time off, you just have to clear it with your supervisor um, and, and schedule it that way. And once you use up your 20 hours, you use up your 20 hours. Um, well, I think that, that there's plenty to discuss around that. And that's why I was thinking about a work session uh, and, and maybe having that be an, another agenda item, item on it. Uh, I don't know. Um, maybe we don't have a need for uh, another work session. We did get most of the job descriptions done at the last one we did. But I know at my, where, where I work, it, it, it's not frowned on to, to to use your vacation time to take a half a day, or people aren't looking at you like you're defeating the purpose of a, of a vacation day. If that's the case here, then, then so be it. But I have not had um, that opinion myself. My, my, uh, my, my sense is that once somebody's earned that time, that we don't want to constrict and, and uh, how they use it. It, it should be they want to take four hours for a half a day, fine. But at the same time, I'm not sure where that discrepancy <coughs> is in those three days. Because if I'm working, if I want to take a half a day, and, and, and I'm and I'm and I'm on a ten-hour day, I've I've got to use five of my hours. So um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not quite convinced that it's set up unfairly um, right now to to uh, to benefit one one person over another based on, on the number of hours they work in their regular day. I'm not in favor of setting up a, a system where somebody's working 25% of their hours in one week and if they take that day off, uh, they should be getting 25% of their pay for that day. Or if they are sick for an entire day, I don't know anybody that wouldn't feel like it was uh, uh, okay to, to uh, or, or, or a problem with them 
using 20, you know, uh, the same amount of hours to be paid for that sick day. I think if you just track the hours, it's going to come out to be a wash. I think, you know, you just say you're going to get so many hours of vacation time, use it as you want. Mm -hmm. And then they can track the hours. And if you work 10 hours a day, and you know, you can take 10 hours. You can get paid for it one way or the other. And that's where the you know, the discrepancy comes in, and that's, so if you get 15 days of vacation a year, does that mean if you work 10 hour days, you get 150 hours? And if you work 12 hours, if you work 8 hour days, yeah. you only get 96 hours? Yeah. Just take the hours. You know, if you want, if you work 10 hours, I'm going to clock in for a 10 hour day, I'm going to take 10 hours vacation time. Just, you know, say that's, that's how you get allotted so many hours. And if you work 10 hour days, you take 10 hours, you work 8 hours, you get more days. You know, just do it by the hour. You know, just keep a record of how many hours of vacation time they have. And they can take them, you know, if they if, as they will. You know? I think where the where where the disconnect is, is we're talking about employees getting so many days of vacation time, mm -hmm. uh, and so you're right if you change that so that they get so many hours of vacation time uh, based on a 40-hour work week, mm -hmm. then then you end up adjusting for any kind of a inequity that might be there. I certainly agree with Diane about the eight to 12 uh, years of the three days of jump. You know, if you get an eight hour day, somebody's making 24 hours of vacation pay and the other person's making 30, that's not equitable. I mean, but I guess what I don't understand about that is how does that not apply to the first seven days, the first right, 12 days? I mean, it doesn't like, it's all the same. I mean, I, that's what I don't understand that, why there's any difference there. And if I don't, I think it would be good to track it by the hour. That would be fine. But that's a policy. That's something we'd have to change right, in right. the policy. That's right. And that's right. Um, you know, and again, to what the policy currently reads, it's you know a vacation day, day is a vacation day. And um, if that's something that we want to change, we can. We have the authority to do that. But um, right. not tonight. But <laughs> but the only question I have again is that how do you make up that? That hour of difference, and there's ways to do it. I mean, the, the power company, uh, New Hampshire Co-op, um, they, you know, they work 10-hour days, four days a week, um, and they're required to make up the two hours that they would lose, or they take um, a day off in a week, I think. And I'm not quite sure how their policy reads on that, that kind of stuff, but it does get confusing. Um, I but they don't do that no more. They don't let their employees work 10-hour days anymore, just for that. Inequality issue. Yeah. They used to, but they don't anymore. You could do I'm not suggesting you do that here, but you could simply do the math. Hmm. Okay, tw twelve days. If you're, if, uh, uh, how many hours a year does that equate to? Well, that's ninety-six hours, and so you could just uh, take ninety-six and and divide it by twelve months in the year, and that's how much. Uh, uh, vacation credit a full-time employee gets when they work a month. Uh, that, that's how my that's how my um, vacation time works. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem with that is when you translate that into the ten-hour day. That's person, right. Because well, that's, well like, it's still a forty-hour week though, and so it's still a hundred and sixty-hour month. But by the time you've used up all your vacation hours. Right. You only like if you've got 15 vacation days, you end up with only 12 days that you could actually take. 12.6 days. Right. So, how does that? What do you do about that? Well, if you, yeah, if, you, if you're working, if you're working 40 hours, it, it should should come out in the wash. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think so. Uh, it, but, it doesn't. Um, well, I guess. <clears throat> it doesn't come like, out in the wash when you get three additional days. Because it's not divisible by 10. What is, I don't, uh, that, that's the part of yeah, not I'm making any sense at all to me. I mean, it's. Well, I went to the trouble of re writing this up and you didn't read it. Just you would have. Um, well, I read it. I, I, I read through it several times. It was actually, but, but I just don't understand why, why the, the, the last three hours should be handled differently than the first. Three, well, three days, I mean. First three, uh, for last three days, rather, yeah. It should be handled differently than the first 12 days. That's the part that I'm not quite clear on. So, um, 
I don't know if we're, if we're going to handle the first 12 days of vacation time as actual days, then that, that seems like that should spill over and be how we handle those next three days of vacation time for employees with more than eight years experience of, of time. They shouldn't be handled differently because they've been here eight years. Or I, I'm not convinced they should be handled differently, I guess is what I want to say. So we either need to back up and handle everything as hourly from the get-go, from the beginning, or handle everything as, as days and recognizing if my job description says I'm working four 10-hour days, then uh, I, I don't know why um, I wouldn't be expecting uh, a full day uh, off when I, when I use you know, 10 hours of my, my time. Yeah, that's, I think it's something that we should take a look at. It would be good to have a, a, a work session to discuss it. I don't know when we're going to schedule one at this point in time. Um, but um, Have there been issues with how any uh, checks and vacation pays been been handled recently or any, any issues coming up well, soon that you can see some. where an, an employee that's been here for eight years is, is there's a disconnect on how they should be paid? Well, we had an employee who had an employee who works a 10 hour day. They um, asked for two personal days after you've made the change, no more hour tracking. They got 20 hours of personal time while the rest of the employees only got 16 hours of personal time. Then, if, if people who are, are, are working eight versus ten hour days feeling like they're, they're getting shortchanged in some way, we should back up and handle that as hours from the get go. If, 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 that's the only way to make it fair from the beginning. You can't just turn around and start handling days as hours after they've been here eight years. You can't, I don't understand how you can handle those last three days differently than the first 12. I might have said it, so that's the piece that I think that we need to get to the bottom. So. Are we going to schedule our session tonight or should we do that at the next meeting? Or? Um. <coughs> it just seems like we've always had people working 10 hour days, haven't we? It's, um, Carl, with the police department, have you always been 10 hours? That's, I mean, as you've gone back and forth on things a little yeah, bit there, we, right? we've been at 10 hours a day since 2004. Mm-hmm. And then we have the hiring department who works 10 hours a day, 10 hour days in the summer. And then they <coughs> switch over to eight hour days in the winter time. That works great for them. And that's why this hour tracking is very flexible and it accommodated a lot of different situations, except for when an employee uses eight hours I and mean, eight years of employment. That's where it started to fall apart. I, I guess for the life of me, I, I don't understand the math there. I mean, yeah. um, it's, um, you know, if you were getting, what is it before? Eight to twelve, eight years is it? Twelve days of vacation that the employees get in the policy. You get. Uh, <coughs> That's what she said earlier. For the first, for the for years one through three, you get ten days. Okay. From four to seven years, you get 15. And then from eight to 12, you get, you get 18 days. That's three additional days. And then after 13 years, you get 20 days. So this is where I'm not understanding the, the, the math differences. So do you get 10 vacation days a year? In your first That's years. 80 hours for someone that works an eight hour day and 100 hours for someone who works a 10 hour day. Um, how, are those, how do those numbers, how are they equivalent? If you get 10 vacation days and you work an eight hour day, 
that would translate into 80 hours. If you work a 10 hour day, that would translate into 100 hours. How is that not different? The policy, policy also says that if you work a 10 hour day, you're not only going to get four days of vacation, not five. No, it doesn't say that. It says yes, the exact opposite, Diane. It says if you work a five, for those who work five days a week, a vacation week is five days. For those who work a four day week, a vacation week is four days. That would indicate to me that you'd be using four days of vacation if you took a week 15. off. Okay. It says those employees who work a four day work week, one week shall be the equivalent of four days. Four vacation days. That's what it says. Right. And those who work an eight hour day are going to get five days. A vacation it doesn't days. talk about hours, it talks about days. I understand that. But what I'm trying to say is, why, like, the additional three days, I'm not understanding how that's any different than the first 10, the first 15. Because it's inequitable. A 10 hour day person is going to get 30 hours, and an eight hour person is going to get 24 hours. Of the but how is it any different than the first? But that's also true for the first 15 days. That's what my point is. Yeah, I know, but if you look at the policy, it says if you're working a four-day week, a 10-hour day, you're not going to get five days. You're going to only get four. Right. So that's 40 hours. It means, hour it, means if you've taken, it means if you've taken a week's vacation, you've only used four of your vacation days. That's why, I mean, that's what's confusing me about it. But I'm, I'm thinking that somebody's getting 40 hours worth of vacation time. Right? Okay. Four days or five days. It's 40 hours, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay? If somebody works 10 hour days, that's going to be four days. You can't give them 10 days if it's going to make more than 40 hours. It's going to be 80 hours. It's going to be 100 hours for that person if they're working 10 hour days. It's not fair to somebody who works eight hour days when it gets eight, 80 hours worth of pay where somebody else is getting 100 hours worth of pay. Again, I'm not saying that it is fair. I'm just saying that's what, what we're, that's why that's what we want to try to do is make it fair. So you and I are starting here. You're working eight-hour days. I'm working ten-hour days. You're getting ten days of vacation. I'm getting ten days of vacation. You're making more money than I am because you're making more money per hour. I mean, uh, you're making um, you're getting more hours per day. So you're not. Well, it's not equitable for the same for the same two people being hired. You, it does, it's not the pay. It's not you're getting paid more. It's just you're getting more hours off. Is the difference? It's not more pay. The pay is the same. The end of the, that's the same. The end of the end of the year, your pay isn't going to be any more because you're this so, or the other thing. What you're, what you're getting is you're getting more hours off. Okay. So if I'm working four ten-hour days, and I'm entitled to ten vacation days, that's going to be two weeks and two days off, equivalent. Yeah, it's 10 days. If I work eight hour days, I'm going to get only two weeks off. So the other person's getting two extra days. But that's what it says in the policy, John. I agree. That's why I said we need to change it so it needs to be equal so everybody gets the same amount of hours off. That's what I'm saying. A lot of things that, that it says in the policy that you're not doing here. And I don't see you telling you. So I, I well, let's, 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 let's again, it civil here, please. Um, I, 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 I don't understand how the last three days could be problematic and the first 15 wouldn't be, though. And so that's why I'm saying that if people feel this is a discrepancy, we, we really need to go back and uh, divvy out these hours differently from day one. And that's what I agree with. And that's what I'm not seeing how that, I'm not seeing how it changes at all on right. eight to 12 years. And that's, yeah. maybe it's not even important to even vet that out. But um, again, the reason why this was an issue this year was because of a police officer who had 15 days of vacation um, after used, using 12 of them, no longer had any days left. Um, and as I read the policy, he gets 15 vacation days. And, um, mm -hmm. and again, to me, vacation days are different than flex time. And the way private corporations and companies run things is different than the way public ones are. John, can you take four hours off of vacation time? I have school? personal time, sure. I can use four hours of personal time. You can use four hours of personal time? But what about your vacation time? I don't have any vacation time. I have, oh, I that's have. That's true, yeah, so. Um, 
it's I'm on vacation different. all the time, <laughs> according to some people. Yeah. But you can take personal hours. Sure. Okay. okay. I have three personal days I can use whenever I want for any any amount of time, any hours. If I wanted to, like, yesterday I took an hour off because my daughter was stranded, so I had to leave school an hour early. I didn't have class, so I didn't miss anything, but that's how it works at school. So, and so that's why I'm thinking that this almost... Uh, and I can use sick time by the hour as well. If I get sick halfway through the day, mm -hmm. I, can, I can leave and, and they just count it by the hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... You know. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong. I mean, I put Bob said earlier, I don't think anyone should be confused anyway about being able to leave and... Um, Come back. And tracking the sick days that way. Okay. Do you have many employees complaining about your policy? Well, that's the thing that I, not that I'm aware of. Well, we, we had the police department, uh, obviously, recently. Well, yeah, yeah because it matter. is mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My point is you're spending a lot of time right. for something I don't see as a big problem. Right. Well, she's having a problem in the office with the recording of it. That's, that's what brought it up. One person. Yeah. Right. I mean, I wasn't having a problem recording it, but I am now. I'm having a hard, I don't know how to compute. Some of this, uh, some, some of this change, and if there's also an equity in it. Just a quickie, where you've got to split, you know, versus ten hour, four, five, eight hour days. Just change it to hours. It's so simple. Bob, I think, and John, I think, touched on it. Just change it to hours. You know, guy gets eighty hours a year. You know, for vacation, any employee gets that much in a certain number of years. Very simple. I mean, they keep track of the hours. Every it's day. it's simple until you you work a four day week, and you work ten hours a day. You take one vacation day that week, your paycheck's going to be less. Is that fair? It'd be ten hours. Right? Ten hours. Can you get ten hours? Well, in, 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 in to you work an eight hour day. So then, hour then you're talking vacation hours, not vacation days right. anymore. So you get a hundred a year, and, you know, use them. And we can and we can do that, but the policy currently doesn't say that. Right. No. And. Um, that's that's why it's a policy issue. Yeah, and that's why I'm thinking, you know, come together as, with a work session. I mean, we kind of. Like I said, I agree with with the uh, doc, doc the second <laughs> that the uh, you know it's something that you know it isn't an imperative issue that we have to solve today. Right. You know, I mean, if right. it rolls over, you know, and we can't get to it this year. Oh well, you know, I mean, I, that's certainly okay. something I think we need to visit, but. I, I think we got too much on our plate to have a work session so, between now and, and uh, town meeting. Uh, rather uh, than scheduling a work session, John, yeah. we can just say that the next time we have a work session, we'll, we'll, we'll put this on the agenda. agenda also. Yeah. How's that? That sounds that good. Makes sense? Perfect. All right. Okay. There. So the question is, if a person works a 10 hour day, does that mean they're going to get five, 10 vacation days a year? We're not going to change the policy tonight. No, I know, but so day is um, a day. Day is a day. You're going to handle the year eight employee the same way you're handling a year seven employee. How, okay, until until we change the policy is pretty much how it has to be. I think. Sixteen C. Job descriptions. Um, The last work session we finalized the last one for right. department heads anyway. <laughs> we, 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 so we have all department heads. We have all the, all the final drafts, I believe, of the, the department heads. Um, John, you weren't at the last one. Did you review the uh, job description for the office administrator? Yep. And again, Diana had concern about the, uh, the title. I don't know what, uh, how that came about. Well, obviously, I wasn't here, but... An issue with the title. Office administrator slash slash administrative assistant. Um, well, if we had a job description, we, we, we could go back and, and research what that job description was <laughs> when you were hired. What do you remember what what it, what was it posted? That's the problem. Is town administrator. I have a letter uh, that the, tells me what my position was when I was hired. The the pub, the, uh, the advertisement said the office administrator. Um, um, office administrator. But I don't know that there's, there's much difference between the two. So I don't. Oh, right. I didn't pick up on that, but I mean it certainly doesn't. 
Um, so you could go town office administrator and do away with the administrative assistant piece. Sounds good. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Uh, okay. I don't agree with the job description. First off, no, um, I didn't get the opportunity to review my liaison like the other department heads did. And there are things, there are duties on there that are not managerial that I don't do. And well, there's also, there's nothing in there about welfare uh, administration and that requires a whole skill set. Well, I wasn't there at that meeting, so why don't I take that and process it with that with her and yeah. take care of that issue. Uh, and I don't know what the third template that was used. There's some confusion about town manager of public works, or is it town manager, town manager? I'm scratching my head, and I don't really... Well, there shouldn't be any clear to me what template you did use. There shouldn't be any confusion about town manager. Jackson does not have a town manager. So. I'm not confused. It's the template that I'm not sure that you use. You know, it's not clear in the minutes. Uh, well, we only had Did one we template. Didn't we borrow from a couple of them, though? For the chief, and that, and no. that was easy. I mean, I didn't sit down and... and uh, create this for the chief. I mean, we worked on it together and then it was presented to the chief to see, you know, how he felt about it and whether he had concerns or not. Yours kind of fell in the middle a little bit there because it, it, you, you weren't only an administrative assistant and you weren't only an office manager. You had duties that, and, and, and the, the uh, LGC <coughs> templates kind of make that clear going in that uh, these may need to be adapted to fit with the specific positions in your town. And so those job descriptions were pulled from, I think, three, three different uh, templates. And so, for example, the police chief is also a patrolman, too. He didn't use a patrolman job description. Road agent, he's a truck driver, too. There's a truck driver of job descriptions. Hold Diane, Diane, just... Hold on for a minute, please. We are creating, the Board of Selectmen are creating job descriptions because the town has had an absence of them since the town's been here. Um, and we've gone through a process of creating them. It's been a pretty transparent <coughs> process. Um, and um, it's an important part of getting our books in order, really. And um, When what these are created for, they're not a job description isn't created to list every specific detail that an employee has. Um, they're broader than that. But again, this is a matter for the board to create for the town of Jackson employees, and some of that has nothing to do really has nothing to do with any of the employees we currently have. This is just you know this is what a responsible employer would do, and it's what we're going through. Um, and one thing we shouldn't be doing is um, having a different process for different people. Yeah, I think so. Well, what we shouldn't be doing is debating and discussing and arguing with our employees about what the job descriptions are going to be. That's something for the employer to do. And um, again. What Bob said with the police chief is the same with the road agent. I didn't sit down with Jay and create the road agent's job description after it was complete, had gone through it with Jay, um, and that's what's been done. If John feels he needs the opportunity to do that with you, then we can put these off until the next meeting, and hopefully between now and then, um, that can occur. Um, your, your, the templates we used to put together that job description for the town office manager, um, did I say that right? Town office manager, is that? Office, office, uh, office administrator. Off, town office administrator, which was what we advertised for when Diane interviewed for the job, right? Town I, office I wasn't administrator. Okay. So it, we, we used the uh, office manager template, the town administrator template, and the administrative assistant uh, template. Office manager? 
Yeah. Office Manager template. Uh, uh, town Administrator template. And the Administrative Assistant template. And we borrowed from all three of them. We borrowed, we borrowed from all three. We, we considered all three sections under the essential duties. I think that uh, some of the some of the other uh, pieces further on knowledge and skills and abilities and minimum qualifications and physical requirements were all pretty much consistent across the board. It was really the essential duties that we wanted to to take a look at, and, and that's where we pulled them from. And and it seemed like we were we were doing that based on. Um, suggestions uh, in, the, in the template itself. Uh, suggested guidelines only for the following job descriptions. Uh, not everything contained in this sample will be applicable to every town or city. You must customize the job description to accurately reflect the essential duties, knowledge, skills, abilities, and qualifications required in your community. And so that's why that's why we did what we did. And so in, in my mind, that, that was a real consistent process for all the department heads. Um, Can I ask a question? So I don't... I mean, what is Ella's job description? Is that administrative assistant? No is town, employee town employee has a job description. Just management. What's that? Just the management. So currently, no, no, no town employee has a job description. Presently. Yeah, presently. Presently. Oh, no, you're developing yeah. them. We're developing them. Yeah, right. developing them. So right. the question they had, I guess, was what is Ella's job description? Is it done? Well, at our very first work session, what the plan was develop the job descriptions for the department heads so that the understanding of their essential duties and responsibilities and roles is, con is, is clearly understood and then work down from there. So we're starting with the department heads, and once we get those all squared away and finalized, uh, we'll be working with, uh, for Ella's, for uh, uh, the, the, the staff under the road agent, the staff under the chief of police, the staff under the, uh, the town office manager. Well, that was the one difference that we weren't going to do, just like we're not doing for the fire department either. Um, fire department. The, there's legal reasons why it's hazardous for a town to create job descriptions for the police officers. Right. Um, right. So that we won't be doing. Um, but it's a separate matter. Well, but it, it, the chief and I have talked about it and recognized the need for that, and, 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 and that'll, be, that'll be something he'll be working with. But it would appear that we have Ella working, I guess, 32 or 40 hours a week as an assistant to the manager, the, the town administrator. Why would you have Diane as an administrative assistant? I can understand if it said, you know, management and, and uh, assistant to the board of selectmen. You know, that would make some sense. That could make sense. But administrative assistant is something that she's probably going to be delegating well, those duties to society I, this I think I'm, I think I'm seeing the, the misunderstanding here. Um, if there was a misunderstanding, I apologize. But um, there is no template offered from the LGC, nor could I find one really anywhere for um, someone called an office administrator. Um, the position of office administrator, if we use them, used to be until we hired Diane, was administrative assistant. Um, that's what they'd always been called. Well, um, again, when Tracy worked here, she was called the administrative assistant. Um, at any rate, the name changed to office administrator. They're one and the same to me. They mean the same thing. Um, we've never had a town administrator. Town administrator is somebody different than an office administrator. Um, Dad? In my years of employment, I've worked for almost a dozen, a dozen different employers. In some capacities, I wrote job descriptions in some description, in some places I didn't. I never, ever negotiated with an employee over a job description. Right. And, and, that's the, and that's the piece. I mean, I think we're working with people to make sure they understand what their essential duties are. I've explained them to employees and had them explain right. to me. Right. But I never negotiated with an employer or an employee in writing a job description. Um. My issue was not 
telling the board what to do. My issue is the process that they use. That's what I'm questioning. So you have a problem with the process that we used for developing the job descriptions? Okay, so noted. Okay. Um, are we prepared to, to um, finalize these tonight, or John, did you want some more time to? Yeah, I need time to work on that one. Well, let's roll it over then, since John uh, needs more time. Easy enough to do. Um, let's move on to the uh, Unsealed Lewis litigation minutes. Um, I haven't had time to review them. Have, has anybody reviewed them yet? No. Negatory. Well, we'll get to that when we get to that. Um, Shaw and Chase water drainage matter. Um, I haven't talked to Peter about it yet. Um, I was been hoping to do that two weeks ago. I was hoping to do it last week. Peter was on vacation. I don't know if I'll get it to it tomorrow or not, but still need to, to do that. Okay. Um, and we never formally adopted the non-public session minutes is something I think that we can use um, until we have a kind of a board policy established. I'm not sure what it would really mean to officially adopt this anyway. So um, I think it would just be a good form to use when we go into non-public session. Yeah, I think we all felt that. Okay. Um, and that's all we have for this evening's public part of this. Um, I'd entertain a motion to go into non-public session. Um, Pursuant to RSA 91A32E um, for the purposes of protecting someone's reputation. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Hank. Thanks, Hank. Thank you, gentlemen. So for the planning board meeting. Planning board meeting is at 7:30. This probably shouldn't. Yeah. Take too long.